Okay, in interest of time to make sure we have time to listen to our speakers as well as uh, ask questions, we'd like to get going. So first of all, thank you so much for spending this evening with us and we appreciate the, the interest and we appreciate your participation. So my name is Stephanie Musterman Scriven and I'm the Executive Director of the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission. And tonight we will be talking about equity and healthcare um, before we jump into that, um, I want to mention or we want to mention about um, privilege. So privilege describes benefits that belong to certain people because they fit in a specific social group or have a certain um, identity dimension. Um, there are many different kinds of privilege from um, ethnicity, race, gender, um, ability level, religion, sexual orientation. And we tend to pose a question to our speakers and uh, the moderators, Angelica and I. Um, and the question tonight is, if you recognize your privilege, what do you do with this realization? So my response to that question is, um, I recognize that I am white, white passing, and that is certainly a privilege. And so what I choose to do with that is I try my best to um, listen to and amplify the voices of those who have been minoritized or marginalized in our community. Um, I also try to educate people. So the burden to, isn't always on the people who are already marginalized. And frankly, sometimes I just step back and I allow the space for people to um, speak and share their truth. So that's, those are the things I try to do. Angelica, over to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, Angelica Veneta, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the Senior Manager of Volunteer Engagement at United Way of East Central Iowa. Um, and I recognize that I have a, many types of privilege. I've had a lengthy career in nonprofit work and I know that I've been able to do that because of my husband's socioeconomic privilege and the fact that I live in a dual income household with adult children. Um, I also have other types of privilege including able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual, in which I don't have to worry about some of the discriminatory practices that these communities face. I use my privilege then to advocate for change by creating brave spaces for individuals who are sometimes uncomfortable sharing their truth and their reality with others. Um, I am going to pass it on to Kristen Roberts to kick off today's session. Uh, she is United Way's president and CEO. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. When I look at the privilege that I have, I would emphasize what the two, uh, Stephanie and Angelica, our hosts have said. I think white and female are two privileges that I recognize most often and beyond things that they have also said. I think the one thing that I always try to do is just step back and recognize when I say something and then verbalize it and say, that's the point of view in which I come from. And I recognize that there's probably a point of privilege with that view as well. And then try to listen to what other people may throw out there as well. But thank you for coming. This is our third session that we have had. Some of the faces here look new, but what is also nice to see is there's a, a repeat customer, so to speak, with people coming back for these conversations. So thank you again, just welcome being able to spend a Tuesday night at 6.30 at night after, I think last week I had six Zoom meetings on Tuesday and then to go to one more in the evening seems to be a lot, but I know you all face the same thing at home. And so just thank you for being here, being able to open your mind up, hear a different perspective, learn a little bit, and then most importantly, being willing to say, hey, I'm gonna share this information with someone. I'm gonna have a conversation with somebody. And hopefully there is that one piece that you are going to take and say, I wanna teach somebody about this. So thank you for coming. Thanks for having the open mind. Please just do engage in the chats and the conversations and the polls because I do know, I know for a fact that you will get something out of tonight. So thanks for joining us. We will um, a little bit later if we um, get into the group discussions, we do have just some guidelines that we would like for us to follow just um, to ensure we have some good engagement. So we just added some tips for these conversations. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is we are here to um, listen and to learn from one another. We are here to grow 
and develop ourselves as individuals, as well as uh, we named this purposefully equity conversations, creating a community of belonging. And we chose that word on purpose. Um, belonging is um, beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's where um, all individuals have the ability to make a difference and feel heard and uh, make demands on their society. So as it says here, we invite um, curiosity. Um, questions are welcome. So do use the chat box. Uh, be willing to be uncomfortable. There might be some moments where you hear something that might make you feel uncomfortable and that is okay. Uh, secondly, when we do get to the moments where we have the Q&A, there's a couple options. One is you can raise your hand feature in Zoom and a moderator, um, Angelica or myself, will unmute you. Or you can type your question into the chat box and we'll be sure to get those out. But again, feel free to use the chat box. Angelica and I will be putting stuff in there as well. We have some um, data and facts and um, links to other materials that we would love for you to take a chance to look at. But now without further ado, we have some great speakers. So we'll ask them to start introducing themselves. And first will be Dr. Marcus Barnett. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marcus Barnett. Uh, I've been in practice, oh, around 30 years, according to my wife. So I have to take that as the gospel truth. Um, I work with EIHC. I'm an uh, obstetrician gynecologist. Um, I guess as far as uh, privilege goes, I'm a uh, second generation physician. Uh, my father was Dr. Herman A. Barnett, uh, who graduated from the University of Texas Galveston. He was the first African American to finish uh, that school, as a matter of fact, in any medical school in Texas. And that was the class of 1953. Uh, so, you know, I suppose my privilege would be, I understand uh, issues, I understand uh, racial discrimination. I've listened to stories that he told, stories my grandmother told and what my uncle, you know, stories my uncle told me about growing up in the South and even being a physician, he was discriminated against. So. I guess as far as that goes, I'm pretty in tune with, uh, you know, what all what what it all entails being a, a physician of color. Uh, do you want me to pro go ahead and proceed? Uh, we'll let um, Oak Parr introduce himself. Yeah, so, okay. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. It's good to be with everybody tonight and good to see so many faces who have been on these conversations. So I'm Opara Rice. I'm the CEO of Tanager Place. I'm also our Marion Civil Rights Commissioner, uh, along with Angelica, and, and proud to serve. Uh, you know, I would say that, that my privilege is being a male. Um, you know, that there are a lot of things that I've learned over these last few years, especially uh, about the privilege that men have that women do not have in the workplace. And so part of what I try to do is to make sure those voices are elevated in my organization and, and that um, everyone has a true voice in, in our mission. So it is a pleasure to be with uh, everyone tonight. Good evening. My name is Teresa Lewis, and I am the executive director for the ARC of East Central Iowa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And as a white cisgender female, I recognize my privilege as all three of those. And so some of the things that I do are uh, words matter. And so I try to pay attention to the words that I use and the situations that I'm in. Um, I also work to be as inclusive as possible and want to give voices to um, those that feel that they don't have one or have not yet felt heard. Personally, um, it's very important and was to my husband and I when we moved to Iowa, which is a primarily white state, 
to uh, make really intentional decisions about the neighborhood that we lived in to make sure that our daughter grew up understanding um, that not everyone in the world looks like her and talks like her. And uh, so that is also uh, very important to me as well. So thank you. I'm just really excited to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those introductions. And Dr. Barnett, you are um, ready to go if you'd like to share your screen. Okay. All right. Hit the green button here. And hit share. Okay. Um, this is my introduction. Go to the next slide. All right. This slide shows the, uh, basically it's a mission statement of EIHC, Eastern Iowa Healthcare. We provide exceptional and accessible patient-centered healthcare for all. Uh, being at EIHC, I've learned that this is a, a pretty neat place to practice because uh, we take care of folks irregardless of race, color, creed, ability to pay, uh, sex, uh, religion, or disability, or gender identification. Um, our goal is to improve the health of our uh, community one person at a time, and we uh, strive to be trusted by our patients and a valued and integral part of the healthcare system. And down here at the bottom, it says values, EIHC stands for excellence, innovation, honesty, and compassion. Now, the next item I, I wanna bring up before we go to the next slide, um, the information I'm gonna give you, it, it's not proprietary information, it's not confidential, it's actually public knowledge. Um, I am a true, uh, uh, advocate of the uh, transgender community. Um, and I'd just like to read you something that I found out uh, in the news. Apparently, without sounding too political, there's a Sandy Salmon, who's one of the governmental officials in the House of Representatives at the Iowa State Capitol, who introduced a bill whereby uh, she would levy a fine against uh, physicians, a $1,000 fine against physicians who would help transgender youth under the age of 18 uh, to transition. Now, that would mean hormones, uh, testing, uh, counseling, et cetera. She also went on to say something that you know, it, it really didn't make any sense. She said that the transgender youth, uh, when they reached puberty, would outgrow that feeling. That's really not how it works. Um, you would think that a person in the government who is in a position to pass laws and rules and regulations that we have to live by would probably have done a little bit more research. Transgender is not a fad. It's not someone trying to get attention. Um, it's, if you ever listen to Lady Gaga, the, the song goes, they, I was born this way. Those people are born that way. And, and if she had taken the time to do research, she would have learned about the DNA uh, the, the research, uh, the psychological impact, uh, and the science that goes into that. The transgender youth are at extreme risk for suicide. And that's why I, I, I brought this point up, just to make folks aware of that. And being a physician, I think we have to exercise our, our right to speak out on things like that and not remain silent. Healthcare services, these are the services we provide, family medicine, you guys can read that. Can they see my arrow? 
Yeah. OBGYN, this is me, labor and delivery. We do high risk, I do high risk pregnancy and GYN surgery, behavioral health services and prescription services. These are some statistics on what uh, our combined clinics have done. 13,000 unduplicated individuals in 2019. This is a good stat. 95% of our patients live at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. That's $52,000 a year for a family of four. 38% of them are Black or African American, 7% other, 55% Caucasian, 3,000 homeless or near homeless, over 55,000 visits combined and 622 babies delivered in 2020. That's about 52 babies a month. I was there, I know about that. Health disparities. We have all seen the uh, news clippings or reports of the killing of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and other recent deaths of black people which have unveiled racial in inequities. However, th this is not anything new. We've known about this for a long time. This slide shows a few uh, issues that deal with structural and absolute systemic racism. Um, in the black community, the Tuskegee experiment always comes to the forefront. Look at the dates. This is 1932, and the study was stopped in 1973. Some stats say 1972. Uh, but still, uh, the study was only supposed to last for six months. But what happened is this study went on for 40 years. Um, there was a total of 600 African-American males enrolled in the study. 399 of them uh, had latent syphilis. Latent syphilis is having a positive test for syphilis over one year. These men were in the study for 40 years. Penicillin came about and was started, started to be invented around 1945, and it wasn't until 1947 when uh, penicillin became the drug of choice, the antibiotic of choice for treating syphilis. These gentlemen did not receive their treatment until 1972 when someone said, hey, you know what? That's, that, that, that's not right. That's an unethical study. You know who put this study on? It was the... Uh, the Public Health Service, and the CDC. Um, 128 of those gentlemen died. They died from complications of uh, diseases of the brain, heart, eyes, liver, kidneys, bones, and central nervous system. Under here, uh, okay, next. This is the Imtala law. I'm not sure if every, everyone knows what this is, but Imtala stands for Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which was passed in 1986. This was also called the anti-patient dumping law in which uh, uninsured or underinsured patients were basically kicked out of the hospital because their inability to pay. And they would transfer them to what we called back in the day, the county hospital. Um, and, it, and, and it took quite a while before that uh, law was enacted. And if you look, that was in 1986. So what the heck was going on before that? Well, I just told you, they were basically kicking people out of the hospital. Labor Act was uh, uh, a good addition to the EMTALA law, whereby if a pregnant woman came into the emergency room, had no insurance, again, either un un uninsured or underinsured, they would, they would kick them out and she'd have the baby on the street. These, I've, I've heard actual stories about that. 
Next bullet point, unequal treatment and care, cardiovascular care studies. It's been shown that African-Americans and even women, by the way, have been discriminated against uh, thinking that they did not have uh, heart attacks or myocardial infarction, when actually these days, that's the number one killer of women. One good story is the story about Serena Williams. She was in the hospital being treated. I forgot exactly what it was for, but she told them, you need to do a CT scan because I'm having a pulmonary embolus. They ignored her just like we have seen in other cases where you know, African-American women and men have been ignored by healthcare providers. And it wasn't until she just absolutely persisted that they do a CT scan. You know what she had? She had a pulmonary embolus. Whoops, I went too fast, hold on. All right, social and economic factors that drive health outcomes. I have, a, I have this keyed up, hang on a second. You guys can read this, I don't need to read that to you, but this goes back to um, uh, one uh, issue that I found and one condition and one absolute federal and governmental true conspiracy plan was called redlining. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but let me read it to you. Redlining is the systemic denial of various services or goods by federal government agencies, local governments, or the private sector, either directly or through, through the selective raising of prices. This is often manifested by placing strict criteria on specific services and goods that often disadvantage poor and minority communities. Prior to the Fair Housing Act of 1968, there were no specific laws that protected minority populations from discriminatory practices in housing and commercial markets. Businesses were therefore allowed and able to exploit these groups in order to increase their profits, Redlining was utilized in the housing industry by mortgage companies to suppress minority populations from receiving home loans, to buy homes in other neighborhood, neighborhoods, as well as to deny them the funds to improve their current houses. One prime example of that um, is what happened in Detroit, Michigan following World War II. Maps of Detroit during that time period clearly show that black neighborhoods were segregated from other white or wealthier communities through the process of labeling neighborhoods with any black residents as hazardous. And I have a map here, I apologize I didn't bring it, but if you look at it, there's a red line all around the neighborhood. That's where the term redlining came from. So hang on, I thought I had this queued up. Give me a second. So overall racial health disparities appear to be rooted in social disadvantages associated with race, such as implicit stereotyping and average differences in socioeconomic status. This last slide just shows the pregnancy related death rate by race and ethnicity. And you guys can see this overall, overwhelming majority are black, 40.8%. Over here is uh, American Indian and Alaskan Native, 29.7%. And you can see the additional distribution amongst the other, other races. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you so much for sharing that and the historical aspect around redlining as well. That is certainly something we have had in our own community. So thank you for sharing your expertise. Yeah.
Opara, you are up on yeah. our list. All right, can you hear me all right, first of I all? Sure, sure can, thank you. Right. Thank you, Barnett, for sharing that. And you quote Lady Gaga, so I don't have any cool quotes in any of my, my pieces, so <laughs> laying the gauntlet down. Um, first of all, you know, I'm gonna take a little bit of, uh, of a spin and, and then I can talk much about our work at Tanager Place because I really wanna talk about um, as we look at equity in the community and and how that applies in the healthcare side of things. Um, you know, I think Dr. Barnett did an amazing job uh, describing the social determinants of health. And I think that what, what we all have to acknowledge is that where we live, work and play factors into our overall health. Um, and that can be from any part of the country that you live in, right? And, and what he so eloquently talked about is that, you know, communities that have been impoverished, right, purposely have been impoverished, um, have worse health outcomes, and it's no surprise that that happens. And so one of the things I would say to people is that there is a tremendous amount of data that is out there. And I am always encouraging people, get informed. As a community, we need to get informed. If you go to the Iowa Fact Health Fact Book, I think um, Angelica and Stephanie are gonna put it in the chat, um, you can basically slice up all the health data for the state of Iowa. And you can slice it up and you can really see how it applies and, and, and actually the differences in the counties. Um, and it's a wealth of information. It, it was updated 2019, I believe. Um, and it's there, it's just open source material, right? Um, and so I would encourage you to go there. I would also encourage you to go to the CDC uh, website that talks about the social determinants of health. And you're gonna find that they have very clear community goals that can be adopted. Um, I think it's, it's a 2030 initiative that can be done to help deal with some of the social determinants of health. So again, that information is there for us. Um, but the other piece to it is, and I'm, and, and this is people who know me, you know, I'm going to speak truth to power and we're going to be very honest because we're all family. Um, we have to, first of all, admit that the system itself is inequitable, that those who have means will always have more opportunities than those who don't. Now, Serena Williams, that was a great anecdote that I'm a tennis fan. So I know about that story that even somebody with tremendous means still her gender and her race caused the mistreatment that she got. And this is a multi, multi millionaire, right? So again, you know, there are layers and complexities that come, that come with this. When you look at things being inequitable, when you, when you study the social determinants of health, the first thing that really is talked about is access. And that's what I wanna focus on is access to care. So think about it, if you have private insurance or you are able to pay out of pocket, and it is a blessing, I, I, you can call up your doctor today, get in there, probably see him in a, in a week or two, see her or him in a, in a week or two, you can go see a specialist, um, you can go get those things, you're not really waiting, you are an active health consumer. Let's say you have Medicaid. Let's say that you need to see a psychiatrist or your child needs to see a psychiatrist. Guess what? The, there are limits to who you can actually see. And part of the, the ugliness of the system that people don't like to talk about is it's a resource issue. A lot of providers stop taking Medicaid um, because the reimbursement rates are so low, they can't cover costs. And so therefore they don't. Therefore it is also limited who can be seen. I, we are very blessed. I am a fan of Joe Locke and Eastern Iowa Health Center because of what they do. Um, also, uh, Dr. Barnett didn't even talk about the dental clinic. When they open their dental clinic, they have wait lists. They have to open up another clinic. That tells you the lack of actual dental resources that are in a community for those who don't have means. So we have to make sure that we are talking honestly about what are these gaps in our community and not be ashamed to have those conversations. What is interesting to me is how in the light of some of the violence that has happened in the community and the deaths of young people over the last few years, we really came together to talk about proper interventions for that. We came together to talk about, um, you know, how can we change this metric? How can we move the needle on this metric, right? The set task force was brought together to do that. Why haven't we done that for health outcomes as a community? Why have we not done that knowing knowing what is happening, right? Knowing how many people 
cannot access preventative care. Knowing that we have a resource problem where we do not have enough wonderful doctors like Dr. Barnett to see the number of patients that exist in this community. And we have a tremendous, again, it's not about demonizing anybody. It's about, it's about the, the economics of a, a profit-driven system. That is what it is. And we have to be honest with that. Um, and the nonprofit quarterly, um, in this latest edition, if people have had a chance to read it, I highly suggest it. Um, and I know we're going to provide a link there. It's all about the healthcare crisis in America. And one of the articles is, is uh, profit as the primary driver. Um, and so you may agree or not agree, but we have to be honest about um, the economics that drive our system. Hence why we've been talking about healthcare reform in this country for decades and why we can't quite get there. That's really, really significant. When you look at, in my, in my industry, mental health, and, and years ago, we're supposed to have mental health parity. No, we really don't. Again, it's the same as physical health. Those who have more means have more access to more qualified professionals. That's just the reality. It is not, it, is, it shouldn't be the reality, but that is the reality. And so we are always on the, uh, trying to level the playing field as much as we can and advocate as much as we can. Um, I sit on the, the state children's health board appointed by the governor. And one of the things that comes up almost every meeting, right? I've been in Iowa eight years and I sit at this meeting with people from the Western part of the state and hear them talk about how there are no resources, no viable places they can even take their children if they have a crisis. I watched a police officer almost in tears talking about what they are basically mental health workers, right? How can that be possible, right? Be and, and because we have service deserts and that we don't have. So if you live in the West part of state, right? Even, even more of the economics, you just don't have a provider to even go see, right? So we have to go back and talk about what does access for all really mean to us and how important it is to us. Um, our friend, uh, Dr. Barnett talked about, and I want to applaud you for leading with, with your uh, piece about what our transgender community deals with. Um, and, and finally, the literature is coming out as we run an LGBTQ center and hear about the youth talking about how they can't feel comfortable with their doctors or people won't even treat them. And to have, again, not political, but there is a series of, of very discriminatory bills um, that have been laid out during this legislative session. Um, but there's also a lot of pushback and a lot of people saying, no, nah, not so fast, hold up. Um, because you know, we know right from wrong. And so again, we have to have equality and equity for everybody, regardless of what you may think, right? They have the right to proper health care. I said um, this last year, and, and, and I know everybody has dealt with COVID and been thinking about and watching the death toll rise and rise and rise. How do we treat our seniors, right? How do we, even the way we were talking about seniors, like it's like, hey, the end of life, I guess they good, right? It ain't really affecting everybody. No, we should have been sounding the alarm early the moment we knew what was really happening and that we did not have a good strategy to address that. What we have done to seniors, I think is, is something we all need to be held account for. How you treat your poor and how you treat your elderly in a community. Right, I forgot who said that. It's a famous quote. I can't think of who said it. it. Says a lot about who you are as people, and so we have to go back and redefine what is the quality of care we want for our seniors too. They deserve quality health care too. We don't just write off, you know, people because they they happen to be in a nursing home. Right? That was a that was a crisis. But what happened for us conceptually? Oh, it was somebody else's problem. Oh, it hasn't quite hit everybody else yet. Right. And then and then it's sort of like this mental switch to happen when guess what? When people in their 30s and 40s and 50s started dying, and it wasn't just those in their 70s and 80s and 90s that were dying, we woke up in a different way. It shouldn't take that for us to wake up as a community. So I'm ch I'm challenging everybody tonight, right? We family, I'm challenging you tonight to think about that, to, to step back and look and read between the lines of what is really happening. When you go and and you get medicine. This is what this is what killed me. So I was recently diagnosed as a diabetic. Shocked me half to death and had to start insulin. I go over to get get insulin first time in my life, and the guy says, "Well, that'll be one hundred and fifty dollars for your script." And I I looked at him. I said, "Well, did you run my insurance card? Because uh, I don't think we're on the same page. Uh, something is something is a little off." 
He said, no, man, that's, that's with the insurance card. And I was like, so of course, because I am who I am, I will stop. I had this conversation with anybody. I said to the guy, I said, how do you expect people to pay who are poor? How, how do people afford this? A woman behind me said, they don't. They just don't take it. And she said, it's ridiculous. It costs that much when, for something that's been around for decades. The woman was absolutely right. Why are people having to ration medi medication in a country as resource rich as us? We have to ask, our, ask ourselves that. Why? Why is that? How do we build a strategy to make sure that those who are the most vulnerable amongst us have what they need? Um, we have the power to change that. We have the ability to do that. We have to have a strategy that improves access for healthcare for everyone, for everybody along the spectrum, no matter what age. We have to make sure that we are giving people preventative care because if we don't give it preventative care, we're gonna wind up seeing them later on with much more severe health outcomes, right? We already know the ACEs study, and most people are familiar with that, right? Already talks about what happens when you have adverse childhood experiences. What happens when a community is not given the things it needs to thrive? We're gonna see that in health outcomes later on as adults too. So we can't pretend that these systems are not interconnected and complex. We cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend that we don't see the data that is before us. I did a webinar recently with Dr. Vincent Reed uh, about African-American men's health. And I was astounded by the data, astounded. And I'm saying, why, are, why have we not developed a strategy to say in this community, in this state, we're gonna move the needle with these populations that we know are struggling and lagging. We can do that. We have the power to do that. And my challenge to everybody who is listening and watching is be a part of the solution. Go study the data, go check out the CDC, read about health outcomes, read about health outcomes of somebody that doesn't look like you, as somebody who is not you. You have to care about each other the same way you care about yourself. That's the reality. That is what is going to move the needle. And we have got to put resources where our rhetoric is. If we continue to underfund these systems, they help care for the poor, they help care for the social safety net, we are going to pay a deep price. And we lost a lot of lives last year for COVID because of that. And I think it exposed how just fragile the social safety net is when we watch people in cars lined up to get food. Think about that. Think about all the people who lost their jobs with no health insurance who found themselves, right? With, with, with a lack of, of, of actually healthcare in their community they could access for the first time in their life. Well, that's not the community I believe we wanna be. It's not, I believe, who we should be. And I think that we can, we can make a difference. I think that collectively we have to look for a collaborative solution to say, we are gonna improve access for all. We are gonna improve outcomes in this community. We are gonna study that data. Um, I have to give a big shout out before I stop to our public health workers and our public health team who have been working their butts off nonstop. Um, they are unsung heroes um, as they've been fighting COVID and everything else. And so, so again, we have people who are on the front line who have been fighting for these things and, and screaming um, to please pay attention. And I think that, that this is the time for us to pay attention. I don't want to see us lose another 500,000 people next year because we stopped paying attention. I don't want to see that more people like me in their 40s are being diagnosed with diabetes because I didn't change or didn't do the things I need to do in my 20s to stop me from being who I, you know, this issue today. Um, so I think we can make a difference. We just have, the, have to have the collective will to do it. And, and, I, and I really challenge everybody to, to, to join, to kind of come up with a solution and to kind of let, let's do this together. I think it's possible. Um, I'm still an optimist in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agpara, for sharing your experience and sharing the data. Um, I think I can speak for many people in here that you know a challenge is accepted, and we are certainly sharing that with others because I agree with you, Agpara, that we, you know, together we're building a community that you know everybody belongs and everybody has access and. Hopefully this is one of the first steps to get to that. So thank you so much. Um, next we have Teresa, please. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Okpara and Dr. Barnett, um, for your conversations. And I want to start off my presentation really building off of um, what you've just shared. I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint here. So this came across my desk just today, um, and I kind of reworked my presentation to make sure that I could get it in. But this was a study that was done by a variety of groups um, nationally, as you can see from the top. And they're really looking at uh, crisis standards of care because of what's happened with COVID-19. And so this is a paper that not only provides some data, but also talks about how to uh, revise our crisis standards so that they are not biased and they are not discriminatory. And so I want to point out a few words. So this really, they looked at Black, Indigenous, people of color, disabled, um, those that are uh, obese, they call them higher weight, and older adults. And they really looked at the impact of COVID-19. And so those communities, they said, face pervasive negative biases, inaccurate assumptions about their value, quality of life, capacity to communicate and make decisions, and likelihood of survival. And as part of this paper, they shared some individual stories about experiences with COVID-19. And so there's one in particular that I wanted to share with you because I found it very pow powerful and very relevant to our discussion this evening. So this is about Michael Hickson. Michael Hickson was a 46 year old black father of five with multiple disabilities. He had quadriplegia, cortical blindness and a brain injury. He died of complications from contracting COVID-19 in the nursing facility in which he resided. And even though his wife objected, his legal guardian and physician decided to terminate his life. And the reason was because the physician said her husband did not have much of one, a quality of life due to his disabilities. And the exact conversation read, doctor, so as of right now, his quality of life, he doesn't have much of one. And his wife says, what do you mean? Because he's paralyzed with a brain injury? He doesn't have a quality of life? And the doctor says, correct. So I want to uh, pull back a little bit and talk about a disability and make sure we're all on the same page about what we mean when we talk about disabilities. So the Americans with Disability Act defines a person with a disability as one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of life activities. And so there's many different disability types, developmental, there are medical disabilities, physical, intellectual, learning disabilities, and obviously those that have to deal with mental health. And so most of the data that I'll share in the conversations really deal with disabilities as a whole. Developmental disabilities specifically are an umbrella term that includes not only intellectual disabilities, but also those that are developmental and are apparent during childhood. They're chronic, they can be cognitive or physical or both. And there's a variety of diagnoses of disabilities. And these are the children and adults served by the ARC. And we also serve the hearing, visually impaired, and other disabilities and rare genetic disorders. For those of you not familiar with the ARC of East Central Iowa, we were founded in 1953 by a group of parents who wanted more for their children. And up until that point, if your child was born with any one of these diagnoses to the left, your child was institutionalized for the rest of their life. And these parents wanted more and they wanted to keep their kids home and they wanted to have some services. And so the ARC was born out of advocacy, inclusion, and equity. And those are the principles that we still um, work on today. And we also are making sure that kids and families are able to stay together and included in their community and in the workforce and being productive citizens. So let's talk a little bit about some disability facts. So 61 million adults approximately in the United States live with some sort of a disability. That's one in four of all people in the US have a disability. The percentage of people living with disabilities actually is highest in the South 
And interestingly enough, if you look on the uh, Iowa Department of Health website, it will give you statistics countywide of the number of individuals with a disability. And many of them are concentrated in our Southern counties. And so that begs the question of poverty related to disability because many persons with disabilities are also living in poverty. So does living in poverty increase your risk for having a disability? or does having a disability increase your risk of living in poverty? Which is another conversation for a different day, um, but thought that I would put that out there uh, for your thinking. And in Iowa, 23% of all Iowan adults have some form of a disability. So there's different functional dif disability types and how they're classified kind of buckets of disability. We look at mobility disorders, cognition, independent living, hearing, vision, and self-care. And those run across a variety of different spectrums. And so adults with functional disability types, the most, this is United States data. So the most common are mobility issues, which is serious difficulties walking, climbing stairs, and then cognition, which is difficulties concentrating, remembering, or even making decisions. And in Iowa, it looks very similar. The majority have mobility issues and cognition issues in Iowa, and the percentages follow the same and very similar to our uh, national totals. Disability is especially common in three groups. And why we really think about disabilities as transcending race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, our identity. There are some specifics and some discriminations within disabilities. So two in five adults age 65 years and older have a disability. One in four women, 25% of all women have a disability. And two in five non-Hispanic American Indians and Alaska Natives have a disability. So when we look at disability by race, again, this is US data. At the bottom of each slide, I have where I got the data from in case you're interested in looking at it for yourself. But 33% of all American Indian and Alaska Natives have a disability. One in four, 25% Black Americans have a disability. One in five white. The percentages go down a little bit for our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, Hispanic and Asian populations. And in Iowa, very similar, 32% of American Indian Alaska Natives have a disability and 20% Black, 17% for white. Um, there's no data on Native American or Pacific or Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders. And then the percentages are lower for Hispanics and Asians in Iowa. So now let's talk a little bit about disabilities and health. So two big factors we know that play a role in health outcomes are obesity and smoking. And when you look at across the US, those with disabilities versus those without disabilities, you'll see that individuals with disabilities have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of smoking, so greater risk factors all around. And then when you look at those that actually have heart disease, have diabetes, which are those real disparities in health that lead to poorer outcomes for those populations, you can see that there are significant differences between those with a disability and those without a disability. Now let's look at Iowa totals. So in Iowa, 45% of those with a disability are obese, 30% smoke, 53% have heart disease and 46% have diabetes. So significant increases in percentage and risk for poorer health outcomes. Now let's look across by race, specifically the percent of adults with a disability who are obese or who smoke. So you can see, maybe these numbers are a little difficult to see, but about 41% of American Indian Alaskan Natives are obese and smoke. Almost 50% of Blacks with a disability are obese, 28% smoke. The percentages are a little lower in some of the other racial groups, but still significantly higher. Now let's look at the percentage of all adults who are obese and smoke across the US. And you'll see while they're higher, significant differences, especially in smoking, occur 
across the racial spectrum. And while there's no data for native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders for smoking, there is a more statistically significant difference between those that are obese. So across the board, risk factors, much, much higher for those who have a disability, regardless of race. I found this study particularly interesting. I was not able to find anything in Iowa, uh, but in Oregon, they did a diabetes study where they looked at rates for people with and without a disability. And I like this because it goes across the adult age spectrum and really shows a dramatic difference as individuals age. And so you look at the 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and 65 plus populations, and the great differences between diabetes rates for those with a disability and those without a disability. And then it aligned it with those buckets that we talked about, the different disability functional types, and those with self-care challenges and mobility challenges have the greatest risks for diabetes. And so we have data that we can apply to our own state to look at risk factors and determine some preventative strategies for this population. So let's talk to bar about barriers to healthcare equity for the disability population. Multiple barriers and access issues. One in three adults with a disability don't have a usual healthcare provider. One in three have an unmet healthcare need because of cost. And one in four did not have a routine checkup in the past year. Additional barriers are accessibility. So individuals with a disability oftentimes need accessible buildings, accessible restrooms, accessible equipment. And do we have all of that accessible equipment? Dental care for persons with disabilities is almost impossible to find. And I believe that there's one provider in the Cedar Rapids area that can actually provide dental care for persons with disabilities. Then we have transportation issues. So that is a significant barrier. We do have a few uh, transportation providers in town that can accommodate persons with wheelchairs or other needs, but it's not sufficient and it doesn't meet the need to enable everyone who needs to get to their healthcare appointments to get there. And then finally, communication. And while we have done a fantastic job of taking materials and other information and translating it into different languages, we haven't thought too much about accommodating the disability community. So for example, are we putting things out with large print for those that are visually impaired? Are we making things at a very low literacy level so that people who have intellectual or other disabilities can really understand what we're saying? Do we have closed captions whenever we're doing any kind of broadcast so that we can accommodate other people um, who may need to have that. So many different types of barriers to healthcare equity. In addition, as we talked about earlier, discrimination is based on, it's very pervasive. Non-disabled medical professionals use discriminatory judgment for disabled, black, indigenous, and people of color. And we saw that with Michael's story earlier. So there's a lot of racial bias and biased assumptions for persons with disabilities. And a lot of that is presuming quality of life. That's a big one. And presuming life expectancy. We've had many families at the ARC who said that they were told that either their child would have a very poor quality or wouldn't live past the age of two or three and have lived to be adults. And then there's also minimizing the intensity or duration of treatment and also deprioritizing or excluding from treatment because they think that a person with a disability or age may not be likely to survive the treatment or may benefit less from the treatment than someone who doesn't have a disability. So we know that race and ethnicity have been recognized across this country and locally as having disparities in health and health outcomes. And for the most part, that's resulted in a lot of federal, state, and local efforts designed to reduce these disparities in a variety of different ways. But people with disabilities have been largely unrecognized 
as a population for that attention, even though regardless of race or ethnicity, when compared to non-disabled, they're four times more likely to report fair or poor health, have higher rates of serious conditions as we've talked about, are 2.5 times more likely to skip or delay healthcare due to cost, and have greater barriers to accessing healthcare. So what can we do about this? One is we as a community can decide to recognize disability as a health disparity. And when we do that, money will flow and we'll be able to implement initiatives. And there are many examples of successful pilots that are occurring in different communities and cities across the country that have recognized and are willing to work for uh, creating equity for people with disabilities. That also means there'll be increased data and tracking and reporting that we can use in making decisions and determining strategies for how to best move forward in our community to reduce these disparities. And also it will help to work on addressing some of those barriers to accessing healthcare. Promote inclusion. So we also have done a wonderful job in this community of making sure that we have representation on city boards and commissions and other types of committees and including race and ethnicity in those discussions, but we don't always think about including the voice of the disabled in those decision-making forums. And some of the things that we also need to think about as well is really having accessible communities. So in 2019, the city of Cedar Rapids recognized that there were at least 7,000 sidewalks that still hadn't been made accessible. And so there are barriers just to moving around of our community. Even people who want to go and work out at a gym, there may not be accessible equipment for them. They may wanna to go to the parks, they may wanna travel, but they can't take their person because they may need an adult changing station and there's not one in that restroom. And so they don't feel like they can go and be out in public spaces. And so we really need to have that voice at the table when we're making decisions for our community and when we talk about full inclusion. And finally, professional training. So we want to really promote awareness of disability disparities in our community. It's not always known. It's not always first in thought. And so we really need to bring that to the forefront. There are at least 15,000 people in Lynn County that have a disability. And we really want to make sure that we're addressing the quality of life for them. Creating disability competence in providers is also something, and so we really want to get rid of that making assumptions, especially about quality of life or biases or just the general lack of knowledge around disabilities and some of the disabilities that people present with. And then having providers to treat through the full lifespan. People with disabilities sometimes need care from the time they're born until the time that they die. And so they deserve to have providers that can follow them through that lifestyle, that can work with them and can really do the treatment and the level of care that they need and deserve. So I also challenge you like Opara to learn more and so I have a few resources for you and hopefully you can share them, Angelica and Stephanie. Uh, but Diverse City LLC is a woman, she's a PhD, lives in the Seattle area. She owns her own business and does consulting for diversity, equity, inclusion with companies across the United States. She has her own YouTube channel and she has done a few discussions about race and disability and also racism in the medical field. And so they're very interesting. And so I challenge you to learn a little bit more um, and get uh, involved with Diversity City. And then finally, Netflix has a film that's out right now called Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. It is a story of a group of individuals that went to a camp for crippled um, back in the 50s. And that group of individuals really led initiatives to move forward with file 504, which is the result of 504 plans, if any of you are uh, knowledgeable about that in education, and also went on to have the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. This film is produced by Barack and Michelle Obama, and it really gives you a very strong look into and in history of the journey of people with disabilities in this country. So that's all I have. Thank you guys so much.
Thank you so much, Teresa. We appreciate the, the data and the challenges. I love that we're keeping the challenges alive and well in this, these conversations. If we have some time for some questions, so if you have a question, feel free to put that into the chat. You can also use the raise the hand function. Um, just a couple quick reminders about um, uh, tips for engaging conversation, just uh, keeping the air of curiosity that we're here to learn from one another. And that while we might have different opinions, we are able to have a conversation that can continue to be respectful. As Stephanie said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat box or use the raise your hand feature. But I will get us started on a question. This can be open to any of our presenters. Uh, many of you know that recently the GuideLink Center in Iowa City opened up and that's the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Crisis Center. Um, do you guys have any updates on the Lynn County Mental Health Access Center? I had a little bit of an update. I know uh, that they were given a green light. I just had a conversation with Aaron Foster, uh, who is going to be the director of that center. And uh, first of all, if people haven't met Aaron, she is tremendous and is passionate um, and very excited about what that is going to mean for our community. Um, I'm not sure when it actually will open. I don't know if anybody else um, is aware of it, but I do know that that because I'm going through for a tour next 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 week, that people start to move in, some of the partners start to move in furniture and things like that, and so I think it is getting close to completion. So very very excited about um, you know what that could mean. I think people understand that it is a way to uh, help those who have challenges as a diversion as well for substance abuse for crisis management, uh, so that they don't wind up in in the emergency room, right, where they don't belong or um, locked up where they also don't belong. And so I think um, as we learn more about that, maybe next week when the writer comes, I think we have another equity conversation next week. Um, and maybe we can see if she can join us to, to even just give a little bit of an update. Oh, but I think we have a, a thing in chat. Uh, yes, it looks like Chris Kivett Berry said that it should open up the first week in March. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? Again, you can put those in the chat box. I am also curious to hear from Teresa. I was astounded to learn that only one dental practice um, allows for accessibility into their services. What would it entail for a doctor or a dentist to um, change up their space to allow for accessibility? And, um, you know, I've had some good conversations with Joe Locke at the Eastern Iowa Health Center about this. Um, but the, the, the bigger issue is more for some of the individuals with disabilities who have um, where it's very, very difficult to access them or they are very anxious and frightened about going to the doctors and having people touch around in their mouth. And so the bigger issue is that they really need to put them under in order to do that dental care. And so it increases the cost significantly of those procedures compared to, you know, just you or I going to the dentist. And I think that's a little prohibitive. Um, and many dentists are just not willing because the reimbursement isn't there because it's all Medicaid funded. Um, and so I think that that's really um, where the barriers come from. Thank you. There is a, a question in chat. Uh, do you have specific suggestions on action steps? Oops, scrolled. On action steps we can take as individuals or as a group to advocate for the issues you discussed and or continue our journey of learning. I know one was looking in the data, you know, finding out the facts. Are there other steps you might recommend? I would also say um, for people to pay attention to what is being proposed legislatively. Um, Dr. Barnett really, you know, laid out at the very beginning um, one of the bills that are out there, but there are a lot of other bills that have been um, introduced. And so I think, you know, people must pay attention to what is happening at the state level. And, and again, there, we know that the news cycle, there's a lot that happens every day, right? 
Um, you know, but we also need to be paying attention about these things that are going to really affect our lives. And I would always tell people, get involved in local government, right? Go and ask those questions. Hold our local elected officials' um, feet to the fire. Um, and what you'll find is that you'll have a lot of a lot of our local elected officials are really caring, thoughtful people, and who really get it. And the more that we can advocate for resources, the, the, it, it strengthens their position to go in and make that happen. And so we have to give them as much support and help as they need and also to help move the needle too. Um, but don't be afraid to use your voice and let them know what you think. As well as, as, as Stephanie always said, go look at the data, know what is, know what is happening, know what is, what is being discussed in this community and lend your voice to it. Um, it's very powerful. Thank you so much for that oh. plug in, Opara. Actually, for our next session, we will be focusing quite a bit on how we can advocate uh, to address these inequities with things such as speaking with our legislators, meeting with city council person. That is the um, conversations that we will have next week. So I appreciate that plug in there as well. And I also just wanted to note in the chat for those that didn't see it, um, Caitlin has mentioned that the marketplaces open up temporarily. Um, if you have not heard about that, it does sound like they're going to be on the uh, KCRG news at 10 this evening to talk about um, that. So are there any other questions? Uh, looks like we have one more that just popped in here. Are there other states and countries that are doing a better job of taking care of their vulnerable populations? Who do we emulate? Or who should we emulate? Well, that, I think that might have more of a political lens to my answer than I would really feel comfortable giving. But I, I, I think our healthcare system is set up to have barriers to access and to have inequities. And I think we really need to look uh, strong and hard about about privatization and what that actually means, um, because there are many other countries that have access to healthcare that's universal, that have much better outcomes and much better equity than we have here in the United States. So, and that's just my own personal opinion. I'm not speaking as a, a member of the ARC, but that's my uh, personal opinion is that, you know, we really need to do a better job of creating a system that allows everyone to have the same level of care instead of having different levels of whether or not you can pay or you can't pay. I, I would just like to make a comment right quick about uh, access to health care and paying for health care. This is an idea I've been toying with for the last oh, couple of years. Um, we, we ha when you have insurance, you are paying a monthly premium. Those monthly premiums can range anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to thousands of dollars a month, okay? And I've always asked this question, uh, if you look at companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, HCA, that's Hospital Corporation of America, Molina Healthcare, Tenant Healthcare, do you know how much profit these companies make per year? Let me tell you, anywhere from 42 billion not million, billion with a B, 42 billion to around 60 to $80 billion a year. And here's, here's, here's my, my main question. If we're paying all this money every month for healthcare, why in God's name, do we have to pay a deductible anywhere from 500 bucks to 5,000 bucks? How many houses do these CEOs need in, in Italy? How many homes in Breckenridge, 
So you can go skiing every weekend. How many houses do you need in Colorado? My God, you those houses are six to eight million dollars each. You know how much, how, how many meals you can provide if they sold one of those houses, if one of those CEOs or their cronies gave up one year of salary, guess what? They won't be broke. They would have a couple of million dollars left. So back to my basic question. And and, and that's why I brought us this uh, uh, legislative uh, parity, I guess. And I need to probably get more involved with that. And maybe we need to start looking at rules and regulations addressing exactly what I've just said. If you are paying your premiums every month, they should pay for the whole doggone hospital stay. Dr. Barnett, I'm not sure you'll find anybody, um, maybe I'm not, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I'm not sure you're gonna find anybody who's gonna disagree with you on that. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think next we're going to move into um, some breakout rooms and Angelica will get us moving. And um, on the screen, you'll see a really great um, slide from the CDC that Angelica found talking about health, health equity and how we get there. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We just wanted to share this slide because it easily shows the different components that we can address to help get to equitable healthcare um, and to reduce disparities. And these are things that each of our presenters have already talked about. Um, having successful programs, policy changes, being able to measure the data, um, you know, and building that infrastructure. And so what we'd like to do now really is just to open it up for a conversation and breakout sessions uh, for each of you guys, because as we've mentioned before, some of the best learning happens from each other. Um, and so we're going to break you out into different breakout rooms. Um, and there will probably be about seven to eight of you per room. And these are the questions that we would like you to reflect on. We will also broadcast that into each of your rooms. But the questions that we're asking you today are how can you be an advocate for individuals in our community who lack access to health care? and maybe reflecting on some of the systems and policies that you interact with on a regular basis, are there ways that they contribute to some of the trauma for individuals and families of color or people, uh, persons with disabilities and any of those other um, minoritized communities that we referenced before? And the last question that we always like to you to reflect on are what ways can you create a sense of belonging? So we'll have you be in breakout rooms for about nine minutes and then we'll come back and do some open share because as I said before, we like to learn from each other. Um, so if you will give me just a few minutes, I will move you guys into your different sessions. Thank you. We'll just continue on with our conversation. I went ahead and shared on my screen our poll everywhere question to end tonight's session. And I'd be curious to learn what was your aha moment, your moment of new information, or your moment of surprise. Um, again, just like we've done with our previous polls, you can respond online or by texting your answer. Um, but I would love to hear from some of our breakout rooms. I mean, it sounded like Anthony and Sarah were having a great conversation. So I don't know if either of you want to unmute yourselves and share what you guys discussed. I don't see Anthony. Uh -huh. I'm here. I'm okay, here. there he is. Great. Um, Sarah, we were, you were, maybe you could talk about your intersectionality point you were making and kind of, I was commenting on your, your statement. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me under the bus, I guess. Um, yeah, I was just saying that one of the things we can do to create a community of belonging and a culture of belonging is just recognizing, oh, sorry, my <laughs> chocolate milk is very important to my two-year-old right now. Um, recognizing the intersectionality of the experiences that people have, but also the barriers that people are facing um, in accessing services or accessing healthcare. And I think the easiest step, first step that we can take is just entering into community and interactions with others with compassion and kindness and respect and understanding that 
we don't know what someone else has walked and what their path has looked like, but we can treat them with kindness and compassion. And that is the first step that we can take to, um, to recognizing that people face barriers and challenges that we don't, we don't also share, um, but we can be kind. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It looks like we've got a couple of responses here um, in our chat. And um, again, oh. continue to share those um, by responding to our poll. But Corey just shared that their moment of surprise was finding out that there was only one dentist um, who works with people with disabilities. Um, that I think was my key takeaway as well. Um, and I appreciate Teresa sharing a little bit more about why that is the case. Cause I think some assumptions that we made oh. on my part was just how might you remodel the space, but it has to do much more with, um, you know, having to put under a patient and the additional cost and it goes into insurance and all of that stuff. So um, thank you so much, Corey, for sharing that with us. Is there anybody else that would like to share? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Actually, that would be my aha moment. I didn't know we only had one dentist to do that did that. So, but they talk about the cost of it and kind of plays into what Dr. Barnett was talking about in terms of the money that's that uh, doctors and the pharmaceutical companies have, the CEOs, and also what Teresa was talking about in terms of equity. So because of the money thing, the, the money piece there, the equity will be hard to get to. If that makes any sense, because mm -hmm. that kind of runs together for me. Yes, thank you, Linda. Couple of things that came up is the importance of assistance for co-pays and deductibles to increase health equity. That's a very good point. And then the amount of profit that Blue Cross, HCA, et cetera, make. Yes. Very good. Any other things that folks would like to highlight? I do want to mention the Dr. Barnett talked about the Tuskegee experiment. And one of the, yes. uh, one of the last survivors passed in Chicago, died in Chicago in the 2080s, like mm -hmm. a, around 85, 86, one of the survivors of the Tuskegee experiment. So that kind of gives you an idea how, how re most re kind of recent it is. That yes, it this is once in our lifetime. It's not yeah, like it was. Definitely not. It's not like it was yeah. not in our lifetime. Yeah. Right. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, I think um, Angelica probably can do the information for next week, which you did a little bit earlier as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I was just, um, oh, I have too many screens up. I wasn't sure if I was on mute. Um, yes, Ashley and I were actually talking a little bit um, when everyone else was on a breakout session, how we've reached these challenges today. But I think the number one challenge has been for us to use our voices, to take all the information that we've learned throughout these sessions and share it with anybody who's going to listen. Um, we'll continue to share that with other people. And I think that next week's session, which is really gonna be a focus on next steps, will allow us to do that. So we'll have a conversation next Tuesday on how we can advocate and advance this work um, to address inequities in education, financial stability, and health, and really look to our circle of influence so that we can make an impact in the greater community. Uh, and with that, we will end the session. Thank you guys so much and have a great evening.